Well, hello, everybody. Um, if you've joined us from uh, the first of our webinars, this is webinar number four of our Powerful Knowledge series. I do hope you've managed to join us for our first three. My name is Ian Mosley. Uh, today, we're going to be diving into uh, power semiconductor devices that are used commonly in advanced power electronic systems. Um, we've covered uh, so far on this series the sort of basics of power conversion, rectification, isolated DC to DC conversion. And at the heart of all of that is, is an active semiconductor device that you can control and manipulate the power with. Um, the previous webinars, if you've registered for those, you should have a link so you can view them on demand. Uh, we will also be publishing the previous webinars on our website so you can go in and access those. Um, we haven't quite got around to it yet, but hopefully if you want to access previous content, it should all be there. Um, uh, the format for this webinar will be about one hour long with a Q&A session at the end. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined uh, online today by Jose Gonzalez from Warwick University, who you should see on your screens as well. Um, Jose is doing a fantastic job again today of, of moderating the chat questions and polls side of this, this webinar, which you should see on the right hand side of your screen. Um, so please do enter your questions into the questions box. Jose will also be releasing some polls throughout the webinar just to get a feeling of the sort of stuff you're interested in um, to try and give us some feedback on how we can improve in the future. Um, and over the course of the next few weeks, Jose and I will be swapping roles. Jose will actually be presenting some fantastic content that goes into real detail on particular aspects of silicon carbide power devices. Um, so we're very much looking forward to that. But today I'm going to do a basic level overview of power semiconductors and the sort of requirements we have for them. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it and do enter your questions as we go. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, um, so in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, um, Power semiconductors is, is a massive subject and we've got one hour today, so not particularly a great amount of time. I'm going to try to focus in on some key attributes of the devices we most commonly use here. Um, so obviously the devices you use depend on the applications that you're developing. We tend to develop systems um, that are operating on either single phase or three phase mains voltages. So the sort of voltage capability we need in those devices is typically 1200 volts. So that's gonna be the focus of what we're talking about today and comparing the device types that can service that sort of capability. Um, on your screen, you can see an image. These are the typical sort of power semiconductors. These are modules that we sometimes use for this sort of application, or it could be discrete devices as well. So by high voltage, from my perspective, I'm talking about 1.2 kV. Obviously, it's a subjective thing, but for me, high voltage is 1.2 kV. Um, I'm going to talk about devices without active control, so effectively diodes. I'm going to try and make that as interesting as I can. Um, and then I'm going to move on to high voltage devices with active control, which effectively are transistors, again, in that 1.2 kV class. Um, then we'll have our Q&A session. The, the main focus of this webinar, uh, I'm not a semiconductor device physicist, so I'm going to try to talk about this from a mainly black box perspective of how these devices behave from a black box perspective. Um, there's a huge amount of theory on the semiconductor side that, um, that, that, that I'm not specialist enough to, to describe. I'll try to give a few hints. Um, there's a lot of information you can look at online on some of that if you're, if you're really interested. The main focus of this presentation is to compare the ideal representation of those devices versus what we actually see in practice and have to deal with in real converters. Um, so let's start with diodes. Um, what do I mean by an ideal diode? So an ideal diode would be able to conduct an infinite current in the forward direction with zero voltage drop. It would automatically block an infinite voltage in the reverse direction with zero current flow. And it can transition between those two states infinitely quickly with zero energy loss, either in itself or imposed on external components. However, in the real world, um, any real diode has a maximum current capability and a non-zero forward voltage drop. So when it's conducting, it's burning power and you can only push a certain amount of energy through it. 
In the reverse direction, you can't have more than a certain reverse breakdown voltage because they will destroy the device. And also these devices are subject to a certain amount of leakage current. So even if you don't break them down, they'll still conduct a small amount of reverse current. Um, it's very, very small, but it's still non-zero. Um, and real world devices, uh, real world diodes can suffer from something called reverse recovery, particularly PN junction diodes. Um, which causes loss during the switching transitions. And they also have a non-zero body capacitance that we have to factor into how our circuit works. So I'm going to describe different types of diodes and how each of those or those two main diode types I'm going to describe differ from the ideal and, 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 and how we um, can approximate their, their use in a real converter. So a PN diode, it's formed, so this is about as in-depth as I'm going to get on semiconductor physics here. Um, a PN junction diode or a bipolar diode is formed from a, uh, two pieces of semiconductor material, the junction of which forms a PN junction. Um, the conduction of current in these devices is based on minority carriers. Um, and, and I'll explain what impact that has in a moment. In, in the forward direction, we have a forward voltage drop, which depends on current and junction temperature. And this is an example of a hyperfast rectifier from Vishay, um, which in the forward, well, it's, it's a, I think it's a 30, yes, it's a 30 amp, 1200 volt device. In the forward direction, you can see here, we can support, it's about somewhere between half a volt and one volt forward voltage, depending on current and temperature and that sort of thing. So sounds like a good device. Um, in the forward direction, the current is normally constrained, or at least the continuous current is normally constrained by the thermal capability of the package to remove heat. Um, in the reverse direction, though, uh, we have a temperature dependent leakage, uh, temperature and voltage dependent leakage current. So you can see here, um, if we try to reverse bias this, this diode, it'll, it'll stand off quite a high voltage up to 1.2 kV. But you can see that as we get closer to 1.2 kV reverse voltage, we start to have a bigger and bigger reverse current flowing through that diode. And the interesting thing about PN junction diodes is you can see how quickly that leakage current grows with temperature. So uh, we've got orders of mag magnitude change in leakage current as we go up in temperature from a normal 25 up to, well, the, the maximum rated is 175 here. So they can have quite high leakage problems. Um, the, again, the semiconductor physics of this, if you're interested in it, there's something called the Shockley diode equation, which predicts um, roughly how the forward voltage and reverse voltage behaves in, in, in these static conditions. Um, in the forward voltage, this minus one term is effectively negligible and you get this sort of an exponential behavior. In the reverse direction, you just get this minus IS figure that the exponential goes to almost zero in, in relative to minus one. So you get the, the leakage effectively is IS here. Um, so that's the basics of a PN diode from a black box perspective. Now, in terms of its dynamic characteristics, the, the curves I showed you on the previous slide are, are really, if we were to operate at a DC operating point, what sort of behavior do we have? However, what we're interested in also here is how this device behaves during its switching transitions. So the first thing to mention is because this device has a physical size, it also has a body capacitance um, associated with it, which just appears across the anode to cathode. And this is again, the Vichy hyperfast part that I spoke about before. And this is just straight from the data sheet. We can see here, we have a junction capacitance, which is very, very non-linear with reverse voltage. Um, and it's just due to the, the physical geometry of the, the, of the system, but with, PN junctions, what you actually find is that the, um, the capacitances for those high voltage parts are fairly low uh, in comparison to some one of the other technologies I'm going to talk about soon. So the energy levels in that parasitic capacitance are fairly low. And, and a good example here, if I read directly off this uh, reverse, um, oh, sorry, off this uh, capacitance graph, with 100 volts, we have about 20 picofarads and we're storing about 100 nanojoules, which is very, very small. So PN junctions don't have a huge amount of capacitive effect. Um, however, the real problem you get with a PN diode at application level um, is that they suffer from something called reverse recovery. Um, and this is, 
something that's very, very difficult to deal with. What, what actually happens is that a PN diode, as we mentioned before, is a minority carrier device. Um, and if you go back and think about that junction in the, um, in the device, when the diode is forward biased, you actually have minority charge character, carriers in that junction area. And for it to move to a blocking state, you have to be able to remove those minority carriers or the charge associated with those has to be swept out of the junction. And that takes a reverse current to do that of a certain amount of, uh, depends on the DI by DT and how quickly you're switching it. But there's a finite time where you actually have to pull current the opposite direction to what you would expect through the diode. And that causes loss both in the external circuit, and I'll show you some, some data in a minute about how we can look at modeling that, um, it, ca it causes certainly loss in the external circuit driving that, but it also, can, on the cer certain circumstances, can cause additional heating loss in the diode. And because that happens every single switching cycle, this can cause real limitations on the free operating frequencies that you can operate a PN diode at, especially at high voltage and high power. Um, the QRR is, 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 a, is the reverse recovery charge. It's a measure of how much charge we have to sweep out of that junction. So you can see here, um, it, it depends on the, the current level. So if you're supporting a higher forward current, then you've got more of these minority carriers in the junction. So you've got more stored charge. So as you go up in power, the reverse recovery effects get worse. Um, and also how quickly you can sweep those, those carriers out of the junction to, gives you a, a measure of the, um, the value of QRR. Uh, there's a certain amount of recombination that can go on it. If you, uh, if you, if you uh, um, have a very slow DI by DT, you're sweeping the carriers out slowly, they can actually naturally recombine in the junction. But if you're trying to do it really quickly, there's not enough time to do that. Um, so that's a problem for PN diodes. Um, what I thought I would do is, I, I, I'd show you a simulation um, of that same Vichet diode. So um, we've got a diode macro model from Vichet, which represents quite nicely the reverse recovery behavior. And we can put it into this circuit, which is just an indu a, a clamped inductive circuit. So what happens here, um, if I skip through, I think I've described all this already. Um, what happens with this particular circuit here is, um, imagine at time zero, the MOSFET is off. After 10 microseconds, we turn this particular MOSFET on. And because the MOSFET is in the low side here, the diode's not conducting. It gets reverse biased. And all that happens is we get a linear buildup of current in the inductor here, just V is LDI by DT. And in this case, I chose an input voltage of 600 volts and an, and an inductance of 300 microhenries. And that gives me um, a rising current of 20 amps in 10 microseconds. So you can see the current in the, um, in, in the drain of the MOSFET rises to 20 amps. And then we turn the device off. Now, the instant we turn the device off here, that 20 amps that was flowing in the inductor now has to continue to flow. So it, it freewheels around here and forward biases this diode. So everything's fine. That works really well. You can see that at the instant we transition here, the diode current, which is the sort of red colored trace here, pretty much instantly rises to the same 20 amps. And we're, that's fine. Everything works quite nicely. So we operate like that for the next 10 microseconds, just with the current freewheeling through the diode and the diode just supports the current. Um, and then we switch on the low side MOSFET again at that point here after 30 microseconds. Now at that particular point here, the MOSFET is aggressively trying to take over the inductive load current here, but the diode is supporting current and uh, we're trying to therefore turn off the current in that um, or force turn off the current in that diode by using this MOSFET. So this diode then goes through a reverse recovery cycle. Um, you can sort of see it here in this simulation. There's a bit of a spike there, but you can't really see much. So um, I set a very narrow time step on this simulation just to show you then and to, to, or to allow us to zoom in on what happens during that time frame. So this is the zoom in on when this MOSFET is turned on again to support this particular load current here. So the green trace here is the current through the MOSFET. So we try and turn the MOSFET on at this point here, or just after 30 micros microseconds. So the current in the MOSFET begins to rise. And remember we were at 20 amps before. 
The interesting thing here is you can see that the current in the MOSFET actually has to go some way north of 20 amps um, and it carries on going. And, and the, if you actually look at the current flow in the diode correspondingly at the same time, you can see that the current in the diode, originally the diode was conducting, the current is getting switched off in the diode, so the current heads down to zero, but actually it carries on going below zero. And what that means is originally, if you can see my mouse pointer here, the current is in the positive sense is doing this. For the current to go below zero in this sense, we've actually got a current flow coming down from the 600 volt link, reverse flowing through the diode to sweep that chunk, that, that, that charge out of the junction. And that's this area here. When the current goes below zero, this area here, or the charge associated with that area there, is essentially our reverse recovery charge. Um, only when that reverse recovery charge in this circuit has dropped to zero, so we, we, it drops back, we reach, we reach a negative peak, which is our minus IRR figure. It goes down to zero, and only once it goes to zero can the MOSFET voltage actually begin to fall down to zero. So you can imagine this causes a big problem for the MOSFET because the MOSFET is having to support a significant amount of extra current flow whilst it still has 600 volts across it. It causes power loss. Again, in that simulation, if I actually then measure with a little marker the power loss in that MOSFET here, that's the, um, the green trace now at the top here. During that switching transition here, you can see uh, on the same plot here, we've got a very big spike in power loss uh, on an instantaneous basis anyway, because we've got tens of amps and 600 volts. So it's, it's tens of kilowatts of power instantaneously. Uh, so if I integrate that power loss over that switching cycle, I end up getting back to the energy that is associated uh, and burnt in that MOSFET during that switching cycle. And in the case here, that delta in energy just due to the, uh, or during the reverse recovery time, well, actually it's the switching cycle as well, but for the moment, assume it's just a reverse recovery effect. Um, that is uh, just under one millijoule of energy, which doesn't sound like a lot, but imagine if you were running this circuit somehow at 100 kilohertz and you were subjecting this MOSFET to that level of energy loss at 100 kilohertz, that would correspond in this case to over 80 watts of loss just due to this reverse recovery um, in, in, in this system. Um, so what in this case happens is the reverse recovery of that diode, it causes loss in the actual device that's trying to turn it off, um, which is a real problem because you just start burning power. And there are examples actually, we've built converters in the lab and looked at reverse recovery, where that reverse recovery effect can also cause additional heating in the diode itself to the point where it can fail. Um, and it's all that, that, that really just limits the frequency you can run this converter at. Um, hopefully I've not gone too quickly through that. The, um, the, the main message from uh, the world of PN junction diodes is reverse recovery hurts. It's, it's, it's something that causes a real problem in power converters. So there's another classification of diode. Um, it's made slightly differently. It's a Schottky diode. Um, and it differs from in construction. It's uh, You don't have P and N type material. You just have a, um, a block of N type material. And then you, uh, you, you create a metal uh, uh, interface onto that by evaporating metal onto that N type material. So uh, it's formed from a metal semiconductor junction. And by doing that, the current flow in that diode is now supported by majority carriers. Um, and that gives us something called unipolar operation. Um, and you'll see, well, I, 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 I won't explain why that's um, the case here, but one thing I will indicate at the end of this slide is the benefits that has at a black box level for a Schottky diode. Um, so for a Schottky diode here, you can see we have a similar sort of a forward voltage drop, which is dependent both on current and junction temperature. The example I'm using here is actually a silicon shocky diode, which is a uh, in this in this case here the, the 200 volt 20 amp part. Um, I can't remember who that's from now. That's a fairly standard sort of a, a shocky diode. Um, so it gives you a, a similar sort of forward forward conduction behavior, except that the forward voltage drop is generally lower than it is for a PN. Uh, device, which is great because you have uh, reduced conduction losses. Um, 
In the forward direction, again, the, the current is normally, again, constrained by the thermal capability of the package. Um, so you have safe operating areas and things like that to think about. Um, in the reverse direction, um, again, here, you can see we've got a similar sort of a behavior. We have a reverse um, current, which is a function of the reverse voltage and a strong function, again, of the uh, te junction temperature. So again, if you start making a Schottky diode operate at very high temperatures, you, you're going to suffer quite a lot of reverse leakage current, which is a, which is generally a bad thing because it self heats the thing again. Um, so they have a similar sort of an effect from a reverse perspective as a PN junction. Um, I thought I would put up this slide because whilst I was um, Whilst I was putting this presentation together, it reminded me uh, of, um, of an experiment we did back in the uh, early days of my, or well, actually when I was back at university as an undergrad, and I was fascinated by uh, semiconductors. So one of our labs we did was to make our own Schottky diode. And um, this is just a picture of a, essentially a bell jar. And you can the, the silver color is, is the metal evaporate, uh, being evaporated to create the, um, the, the Schottky barrier junction. Uh, I, I realized, so we, we used equipment very similar to this to make our own Schottky diode. So we were given the end type material. We had to put it in the bell jar to evaporate the metal. And then we had to go and test it. Uh, I, I realized that probably I didn't have a future in, in, in semiconductors because I managed to drop my little die down the sink before I measured it. Uh, so I, I moved then into um, just using the package devices that, that people gave us. And that's why I ended up in power electronics. But this is a, a, a gives you an idea on, you know, how these things can be made. I thought it was quite a nice image to put in. Um, so coming back to the main uh, focus of the presentation, uh, Schottky diodes also have dynamic characteristics as do PN junction diodes. So we have a body capacitance effect. Again, in a similar manner to the PN uh, junction diode, we have a, a, a body diode which has a, a, a capacitance, sorry, a body capacitance, which has a value which is dependent on voltage. Um, it's not a strong, particularly strong fat function of, of, of junction temperature, because it's really just the, the physical size of the semiconductor material. Um, again, you can look at the energy contained in that. It's Generally, you have a little bit more capacitance in a, in a Schottky diode than you might in a PN junction diode, but it's, it's the same rough order of magnitude. Um, key thing about a Schottky diode, and I, I mentioned that um, a Schottky diode is a majority carrier device. Um, with a majority carrier device like this, they just don't suffer reverse recovery because there's no there's no um, minority carrier uh, um, elements in the, in the junction to be swept out. So all of a sudden, we have a device that doesn't suffer this horrible reverse recovery effect, and that makes it a fantastically useful, um, useful device. The only problem that you get with Schottky diodes is that using silicon technology, the typically the maximum reverse voltage you can get on a on a on a Schottky diode is about 200 volts. Um, uh, you could probably dig into the theory on why that might be the case, but um, typically on a silicon process, you can't get more than about 200 volts reverse voltage. Um, however. The key thing here is in recent years, silicon carbide is becoming more mainstream. So you can actually build shocky structures on silicon carbide now, which can reach 1.2 kV and 1.7 kV fairly easily. It's more expensive as a, as a, uh, as a device technology, but for, my, for our applications here where we need that 1.2 kV blocking capability, to have availability now of a wide band gap technology such as silicon carbide that allows us to operate at really high frequencies because we don't have reverse recovery. That's a massively useful thing to have. And that's why we, we use these sorts of technologies all the time now, because it allows us to push the switching frequency of our power converters. Um, if you joined us on previous webinars, Hopefully you've got a feeling on why it's important that we want to be able to push switching frequencies and also the sort of efficiencies that we can start to achieve using silicon carbide are very, very high now. Um, let's take a bit of a comparison. Um, and again, I'm using this 1.2 kV as an, as an example. Let's just take a look at the difference between um, a silicon carbide Schottky diode, in this case, it's a Cree part, and that Vichy hyperfast um, PN junction diode both 
uh, have a, a, a nameplate rating of 1.2 kV at 30 amps, and they come in a similar package style. So let's compare them. Firstly, from forward voltage drop, if you just look at the data sheets, you can see here the um, forward voltage drop of the hyperfast part, um, again, is a function of temperature and current. This on the, on the right hand side, the silicon carbide um, characteristic is actually per leg. This, is, this particular device, uh, the Cree device, has two devices um, within the same body. So we've, we've, we've normalized that to do a like for like comparison. And if you see here, you can, you can get an idea that at lowish temperatures, silicon carbide tend for this, in this comparison case, tends to have a lower forward voltage drop for a given current level. Uh, as you go up in temperature though, um, the, 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 the PN device gets a little bit better. But as we saw before, the PN device has a, has a behavior of a reverse recovery diode, which would just be disastrous at 175 degrees C. So really for, from a forward voltage drop perspective, silicon carbide in this uh, voltage class is gonna give you slightly better behavior in terms of conduction drop. Uh, what about reverse leakage? Um, the, the plots here were slightly difficult to compare because they're, they're plotted out in different ways. But again, I've done my best to try and compare like for like. So let's take a look at the, the behavior of reverse leakage between these two. Um, you can see that the hyperfast silicon um, from, a, from an absolute perspective has a much lower leakage than the silicon carbide, except when you go up in temperature. So you can see here from um, hyperfast silicon goes from six microamps to 700 microamps. So almost a well a, over a hundred times increase as you go from 25 degrees C to 175. Silicon carbide goes from 35 to 120 microamps. So silicon carbide from a leakage perspective is far more stable with temperature. So you can it means you can operate silicon carbide, all these sort of wide band gap technologies up at higher temperature uh, reliably than you or more reliably than you can with a, a normal sort of a PN junction diode. Um, then let's take a look at body capacitance. Now, this is a really interesting comparison. And again, the slides are difficult to see here. So I've tried to normalize it on a device level for these two particular um, parts. Let's take a look. So firstly, um, as we go up in voltage, the, uh, the body capacitance is, or the, the, this is the output capacitance of the diode, tends to reduce. Um, so with silicon carbide, you've actually got much bigger output capacitance here. So with silicon carbide, it's a shocky structure. Again, we've got a much higher output capacitance than we have for a PN junction diode. Um, there may be other comparisons, but for this comparison here, hyperfast seems to be much better in terms of that capacitance, about seven to 10 times better. So why? Based on this, do we want to use silicon carbide at all? You know, the uh, the forward voltage drop was about the same. The capacitance is fairly comparable. The key thing is reverse recovery. Um, if you look at these, um, the, the the silicon device here, we we saw that before. Um, there's lots of data and different ways of looking at this, but we this is a hyperfast part, so this is actually. The manufacturer here has tried very, very hard to, to, to really optimize the reverse recovery behavior. So this is quite a fast and well-behaved part, but it's still a PN junction diode. And you can see here we have QRR figures um, in the order of, you know, um, around about one, uh, one microcoulomb, depending on the operating conditions. Um, and the reason that silicon carbide is so much better there is to, to, to a large approximations, silicon carbide has zero re reverse recovery. So it just doesn't suffer this sort of an effect. And if you remember back in the earlier slide in this presentation, I was talking about the impact that reverse recovery has on a switching power converter. It, by using silicon carbide diodes, it means that you the, the, this, this limitation on switching frequency due to inefficiencies is, re is removed. And you can start utilizing um, switching frequency is way higher than you might have been able to with a normal sort of hyperfast diode. So we, we've used silicon carbide devices running on, um, you know, 800 volt DC links, running at hundreds of kilohertz now. Uh, it really is amazing what this technology can achieve. Um, so that's been a, a sort of a brief overview
of diodes. Uh, who, who'd have thought there's so much to them? And there's so much more to them than I've even described today. Um, uh, do, do dig into them, particularly silicon carbide devices, because their performance is fantastic. Uh, the second half of this presentation, I want to focus more on the actively controlled devices. And again, there's, there's multiple devices around that you could choose to talk about. So I'm going to focus on two main types, uh, because these are the two main types that we most commonly use here. So MOSFET devices and IGBTs. And it's mainly because of the, the voltage level at 1.2 kV. That's a real sweet spot for these technologies. So again, coming back to our ideal uh, versus real world model, uh, in the ideal world, we want to be able to conduct our infinite current in either direction when turned on with zero voltage drop. We want to be able to block an infinite voltage in both directions when turned off with zero leakage current. And we want to move infinitely quickly between those two states without burning any power. Um, also, ideally, we don't want to have to use much energy to drive the control signal here. So ideally, it needs no power. However, that utopia doesn't exist and never will. So in the real world, most power semiconductor devices, you can only actively control current flow in one direction. Um, there are some, um, uh, some devices coming out now which uh, may be able to support bi-directional control as well. But most devices you see on the market at the moment is just one, one direction you can control it. And they, they have a forward voltage drop, so they're going to burn some power when they're conducting current. They can only block current in one, or actively block current in one direction, um, because typically they've got a parasitic body diode in the, in the reverse direction. And they also have uh, reverse leakage, which uh, in similar manner to the uh, the diodes I'm talking about, it's just a leakage which, which flows when the device is off. Um, they also take a finite time to transition from the on to the off state, and they burn energy to do that and the control signal always needs to provide some energy, although it's quite low these days, um, most of the voltage fed si uh, systems. So let's look at our MOSFET and IGPT uh, uh, to compare how they are in the real world versus this ideal approximation. So IGBT on the left um, has gate emitter and collector and the MOSFET has gate drain and source. Um, again, the IGBT is a bipolar device and that it means it's using minority carriers to support the conduction of current. So that gives you a bit of a feeling. It's a bit like an active version of that PN junc uh, junction diode. It's using, it's, it's using uh, minority carriers as well. The great thing about that actually though, is it gives you a roughly fixed forward voltage drop. And I'll explain why that's quite neat for high power systems in a minute. Um, it natively cannot support current flow from the emitter back to the collector. Um, and in most systems, you actually have to provide a route for that for inductive current flow to do that. So normally you have a separate body diode connected backwards from the emitter to the collector to support that. Um, and the device is voltage driven. So you, you apply a voltage typically 15 to 20 volts on the gate to the emitter and it will turn the device on. However, the switching is quite slow, and I'm going to talk in a few slides time about something called tail current, and this is a big problem for IGBTs. Now, a MOSFET is a bit different. It's, um, it's actually a unipolar device, and by that I mean it's using majority carriers to support the current flow. So in that case, this MOSFET actually, when in the on state, behaves like a, a resistor. Um, so the drain source voltage is just the current multiplied by that on resistance. It actually also has an inherent body diode. Remember that body diode going back from source back to drain here? That's something we want, but in the in a, in a MOSFET, it's actually there as a, as a parasitic part of the way the thing's built. You can't avoid having it. And the trouble is, is that that reverse diode, the body diode normally has very poor reverse recovery behavior. And again, that can cause problems. The device, though, is nicely voltage driven. You just put a voltage on gate to source a bit lower than the IGBT. You might go 10 to 12 volts, perhaps a little bit more, but you don't need to go to 20 volts with a MOSFET typically to, to turn it on nice, nice and, and, and strongly. And the switching can be very, very fast, certainly much faster than the IGBT. So the MOSFET sounds like quite a nice part. Let's take a look 
at the forward conduction behavior of an IGBT versus a MOSFET. And I, I've chosen two, two examples here because it's always good to try and benchmark these things. So again, I've chosen um, an IGBT here on the left, which is a 1.2 kV part with a 30 amp uh, rated capability. Um, and on the right, I've got a, a MOSFET from Ixis, which is 1200 volts, 30 amps again, has an on resistance of about 350 milliohms. So let's look at their forward conduction curves, and again, taken straight from the data sheets. With the IGBT, you can see here that um, as soon as we start supporting any level of current, we roughly have to support a forward voltage drop of somewhere between one to three volts here, something like that. Now with 20 amps flowing through this thing, assuming it's fully, so if it's fully switched on, say a gate to emit a voltage of 20 volts, we're, on, we're following this first curve going up here. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. Um, so if we then expected it to support a current of 20 amps, we'd have about two volts drop across the, um, uh, across the collector to the emitter of that particular device. However, if we then want to support 100 amps, which we shouldn't do because it's only a 30 amp device, but theoretically from the curves, if we were to support 100 amps, that forward conduction drop uh, would only move up to three volts. So you can hear, see here, we've gone up five times in, in current, but the, um, the forward voltage drop has only increased by 50% here. So that means that for very high current levels, this sort of bipolar conduction performance is going to give you much, much better loss than, a, than an RDS on type performance. So let's compare that to the same um, curves from the MOSFET data sheet here. You can see it's a MOSFET. So again, let's turn it on, on fully. Uh, in this case, uh, the, in their data sheet, the, the fully turned on MOSFET, you put 10 volts gate to source. So that's the top curve here. Um, as you increase the current, through the system, the voltage drop across the device increases as well, just in line with the on resistance here. It's just a, a, a constant voltage drop. So the conduction losses in the MOSFET case are roughly proportional to the square of the drain source current multiplied by the RDS on. And in the case of the IGBT, it's just the product. So uh, just the product of the current and voltage. Um, so what I thought it'd be quite a good thing to do to explain the difference here is if I draw a line here on the MOSFET curve, roughly where the VCE sat of this IGBT is, then I can state that for both of these devices, just in just conducting forward current, if we had a current of less than, um, in this case, uh, it's about six amps, something like that, the conduction loss of the MOSFET is gonna be um, much lower than it is for the IGBT. So that's good. So for very low currents, the MOSFET's better. But if we exceed about six amps, something like that, the IGBT with its constant volt or much more constant voltage drop uh, as a function of current, the IGBT very, very quickly becomes far superior. So for very high current systems, especially in the sort of voltage class of 1.2 kV, if you're pushing a lot of current, an IGBT is a fantastic device from a conduction perspective. It, it really is, um, you, you can support huge power levels. Um, MOSFETs are somewhat limited in that regard. Uh, so that's the main difference from a conduction perspective on these two devices. Let's take a look at reverse conduction. Um, so again, this is just data from the, the, the data sheets of the devices in, that I've used as an example here. Um, you can see here uh, in the IGBT case, they've actually added a, bo a reverse body diode. Uh, and these are the char characteristics of that reverse body diode. So it's got it's a, it's, it's a PN junction. It's got reverse recovery behavior, a bit like what we described earlier on in this webinar. The silicon MOSFET here, again, we can get the characteristics from the data sheet. And this is a parasitic part, so it's uh, it's not necessarily... A, a diode which is designed to have certain characteristics. It sort of is a result of the attributes of the rest of the performance of the silicon MOSFET. Um, they actually turn out to have roughly similar sort of characteristics. They're both um, have forward voltage drops of, of about one and a half, 1.75 volts here. Um, and they have reverse recovery times that are roughly the same order of magnitude and QRR, again, roughly the same. So the reverse behavior is pretty similar between these devices. Um, the, the 
really important thing about an IGBT though, I, I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation today is this tail current. Um, if you remember an IGBT is a minority carrier device. Um, and what happens when you try to turn that IGBT off, it's got the same trapped um, charge of minority carriers that need to be swept out of the junction of that device for it to turn off. And that appears in, in an IGBT's case as an additional current that had to flow when you turn the device off, and that's known as tail current. Uh, again, I thought I would do a simulation here just to try and show uh, uh, graphically what this looks like. So if you remember back to the earlier part of this presentation, uh, we had a slide where we we're talking about this, this inductive clamp circuit. I'm using exactly the same one here. In this case here, I'm using an ideal diode. So this diode, the D-brake diode, doesn't have any reverse recovery behavior because I, I don't want that to muddy the water here. Um, so you can see the first 10 microseconds, nothing happens. There's nothing switched on. After 10 microseconds, the IGBT is turned on by, uh, by putting a, a, a voltage on its gate. Uh, and the current then climbs in the channel of that particular device. Uh, and we get up to about 20 amps in 10 microseconds, pretty much the same as before. Then we try to turn that IGBT off here. Now, if you remember back to the example I gave you in the, uh, in the earlier slide, that turn off of the MOSFET in that case happened very quickly. But you can see here, if you look at the current in the IGBT, it doesn't, even though the, the gate command, so the gate command is the red trace, the gate command, we've, we've told the MOSFET to turn off as quickly as we can, but the IGBT actually turns off quite slowly. It, 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 it takes a little bit of time to do that. And it, that corresponds to an additional power loss in that particular device. So if you look at the product of voltage and current across that IGBT during that event, you can see we get this yellow area, which is just related to uh, power loss related to the tail current uh, having to flow. So that causes power loss in the IGBT. If I look at that power loss and integrate it over the, um, over the tail current event, you can see here, so the, the bottom curve is the current flowing in the, in the, in the um, collector to emitter of that IGBT. The power loss is the yellow one, and I've just integrated the yellow curve to give me the actual energy loss again during that event. So let's measure that. We can see that just due to this tail current here, I have an energy level of being dissipated of 1.24 millijoules in that particular IGBT. So it doesn't sound like a lot of energy, but it causes big problems. Um, and if you look through the data sheet for um, most IGBTs, they will actually give you um, values of this energy, the E on and E off figures, as a function of temperature and, uh, and, and, and other parameters for certain inductive, uh, uh, clamped inductive switching like this. So you get a feeling of this is how you can benchmark IGBTs. Um, and that one millijoule or 1.24 millijoule I showed you before, that's of the same order of magnitude as what you can see here. Now, the interesting thing again is if you were to take that IGBT and try and switch this circuit at 100 kilohertz, look what one millijoule can do. One millijoule dissipated 100,000 times a second is straight away 100 watts of power, which is just impractical, it will kill your efficiency. So what this really means is that with an IGBT, you typically can't use them much, or at least the high voltage IGBTs here, you can't really use them much above 10 to 20 kilohertz because this tail current just kills your efficiency. Um, there are types of IGBT where the semiconductor process is modified to allow the manufacturer to play around with the on to, to play around with the on state voltage and balance that against the tail current. So it's like they're, they're, they, they can sacrifice some of the conduction behavior to improve the switching behavior and play a bit of a balancing act there. But you, you generally just don't, you, you don't see the, the switching frequency of IGBTs much above this sort of a range, even with those devices, because it just becomes too lossy. Okay. Um, so that was a brief introduction to IGBTs. Let's talk a little bit about uh, high voltage silicon MOSFETs. So obviously you can get 1.2 kV silicon MOSFETs. Um, how do they look? Well, 
they don't suffer that. They're, a, a high voltage silicon MOSFET is a unipolar device again. It's using majority carriers now. Um, so it just doesn't suffer this trap charge effect. And therefore, you don't have any tail current to worry about. So therefore, from that perspective, it's possible um, to run, run them at much, much higher frequency than you can an IGBT. However, there's always a few things you have to watch out for. Firstly, if you operate hard switching, you've got to charge and discharge that body capacitance I spoke about earlier, every single switching cycle. And that can lead to, or at least with hard switching you do, that can lead to a significant loss in the MOSFET as well. So you have to be careful of that. Um, you also, to switch quickly at high frequency, you need to have a pretty strong gate drive capability to drive the MOSFET on and off as hard as you can. Um, we have a, a, an entire webinar dedicated to, to gate drives, particularly high frequency gate drive um, uh, in a few weeks time, which I, I don't think we've published for registration yet, but we will be doing shortly. So do join us for that one where we'll go into the real details of how you can design gate drives to drive these devices nicely. Um, however, high voltage silicon MOSFETs, we, we mentioned this poor behavior of the of the uh, reverse of, of the reverse body diode and that again becomes a limitation on how high in frequency you can drive these parts the um, the reverse recovery and the stored charge in that in that parasitic body diode is a real limitation for a normal silicon mosfet you just it just limits your, your well it burns power and therefore you have to limit the frequency so even high voltage silicon mosfets you have to be a bit careful of uh, you can't run them at the frequencies you might think you want to because of this body diode however um again i'm coming back to why band gap power semiconductors and particularly here silicon carbide Silicon carbide parts offer you a way to get around some of this. And, and the best way for me to explain this is to benchmark uh, a high voltage silicon MOSFET. So this Ixis part that, I, that I've used it as an example before. And let's benchmark that against a silicon carbide device here. This is a part from Rome Semiconductor with um, roughly the same quoted data sheet capability. So 1200 volts, uh, 30 amps or thereabouts in the same sort of a package size. The first thing to note is look at the on resistance of a silicon carbide device here. This one's 80 milliohms compared to 350 milliohms. For a given device, this is one of the real benefits of silicon carbide. You can get to much, much lower RDS on figures um, just because of the way the semiconductor material works. So you get far improved conduction performance. So let's take a look at that. You can see here, this, these are our sets of curves between the two. So let's let's just do a benchmark comparison. Um, so generally, silicon carbide can provide those lower RDS on figures than silicon at 1.2 kV, as you can see from these particular curves here. Um, so from a conduction perspective, silicon carbide is great. Um, what about the body capacitance? You know, we've talked about this for all of our other devices. Um, I don't know how well the top you can see the figure in the top right hand screen. It's not come out particularly well on my screen here, but um, what I'm attempting to show here where the mouse pointer is, is the, um, is the MOSFET itself and the different sorts of capacitances that you'll find within the, in the structure of that MOSFET. So on the data sheet, you'll see an output capacitance and an input capacitance, and that's formed by a combination of these three different capacitors here. Let's benchmark what those look like for these two particular devices. So you can go into the data sheets again and extract the um, extract the figures. So the silicon one on the left, silicon carbide on the right, and let's just compare them. So now this starts to get really interesting. So um, again, it's a function of voltage um, that you have to be uh, take into account. So I've tried to benchmark at the same particular points. Um, you can see here for those same operating points, silicon carbide, firstly, the input capacitance is more than an order of magnitude lower than the um, silicon version. The output capacitance here in, in this case is around about five times lower. And the um, CRRSS, that's known as the Miller capacitance. That's a little bit better. Um, it's not massively better, but it's a little bit better. If you map this over into then uh, what the equivalent gate to source capacitance is and, out, and, and CDS capacitance is here, you start to see the improvement in, in body capacitance that you can achieve with silicon carbide. The reason we get such better performance here is that the 
RDS on that we can get from the, 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 the basic silicon carbide material is so much better that you just don't need as much, as much material to form that device. So if you have a smaller device, you just end up having much, much smaller capacitances. Uh, so this is a real benefit for silicon carbide MOSFETs. The remaining thing to compare between silicon carbide and silicon at this, in this voltage class is reverse recovery. So the silicon carbide part also has a parasitic body diode built in, well, or, 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 or in its structure, if you like. So let's compare the silicon, ver the silicon uh, device versus the silicon carbide and see what we get. So let's take a look. On the left-hand side, these are, this is taken again straight from these data sheets. You can see, firstly, um, the, the forward voltage drop is actually poorer in a silicon carbide device than it is in this silicon device. And that tends to be what you see. So you don't really want to be utilizing the reverse uh, body diode in a silicon carbide device too much because you start burning power. So it depends on the topology you're using. But it's if you're, if you're operating a high voltage DC link, it probably isn't too much of an impact on efficiency. Look at the reverse recovery though. Um, the standard silicon diode, we've got a more than an order of magnitude improvement in the reverse recovery time when we move to a silicon carbide device. So the reverse body diode in a silicon carbide MOSFET is way, way better than it is in a silicon device. Similarly, if you look at the um, stored charge, we've got, yeah, it's not quite an order of magnitude, but it's not far off it, a significantly lower stored charge in the silicon carbide MOSFET than we have in the silicon part. So what this all boils down to, it's exactly the same effect that I spoke about um, earlier in this presentation, is if your body diode in your device has much improved reverse recovery behavior, you just don't suffer the same losses. You can run these devices at much, much higher frequency. And that's exactly what we do right, using silicon carbide. It allows us to push the switching frequency of our converters higher and make them smaller, run higher power density and run them more efficiently. Hopefully you've stayed with me during that presentation. I appreciate there was probably quite a lot of information to take on board there. Um, and some of it was fairly high level, but hopefully it's been of interest. I, I did want to summarize some of the key points of that, and then we'll move on into a, a question, uh, question and answer time. So from a brief summary perspective, at, the, at least at the 1.2 kV level, um, PN diodes, even the hyperfast parts, they're bipolar devices using minority carriers, and therefore they suffer reverse recovery effects, which limit switching frequency, and it causes power just to get burnt in the converter. The equivalent SIP diodes, they just don't really have reverse recovery to worry about. Um, and you can therefore use, use those at much, much higher frequencies than you might have otherwise been able to do. So silicon carbide diodes are fantastic if you want to start pushing switching frequency. Um, 1.2 kV bipolar devices, such as the IGBTs that I've spoken about here, if you're pushing a huge amount of current in your converter, like a track, maybe a traction inverter or something like that, it's pretty hard to actually beat the performance, the conduction performance you get of an IGBT. They're, they're, they're incredibly capable devices um, because of that fixed, roughly fixed VCE um, voltage. However, you just can't run them at high frequency. So what you gain in terms of their conduction behavior, you, you pay for in terms of the tail current and having to really slow the switching of the system down. Most, app, or so most traction inverters, that's not too much of an issue. You, you need to be running at a frequency above the audible range, um, but you can get away with about 20 kilohertz maybe and get very high performance. So IGBTs have a fantastic place in very high power systems, but if you're really trying to push the switching frequency, you just can't use them. Um, if you want to get to hundreds of kilohertz, more for like static conversion or um, LLC converters, this sort of stuff, Silicon carbide MOSFETs and diodes, they, they do genuinely bring us closer to that ideal power device for those sorts of applications. And we've built converters here in the tens of kilowatt region that run above 98% using silicon carbide technology. So if you haven't had a chance to play with silicon carbide, take a look around, see, learn a little bit about them because if you can afford to use them in your converter, the performance levels you can achieve can be absolutely fantastic. Um, I think that brings us hopefully nicely to the end of the presentation today, and I think we'll open up the questions now. <laughs>
So let's take a look. Okay, let's have a look at the first questions. Um, let's have a look here. Um, So how does the reverse recovery diode of a diode, how does reverse recovery current of a diode affect switching frequency? Um, it's, it, I, I think that the, um, the, the point I was trying to make earlier in this presentation is the reverse recovery current of, of the diode causes additional heating effects. So um, it might be in that MOSFET that was switching against the diode to try and turn it off. It might be burning extra power in that MOSFET. Or in, in some cases, we've, we, we've seen um, the output rectifiers of a high power LLC converter suffering extra loss due to reverse recovery effects as well. So the problem you get with reverse recovery effects of, in those diodes generally is you start uh, quickly sacrificing um, efficiency. And the higher you go in frequency, obviously, you know, if you're burning that power every switching cycle, if you double your frequency, you'll end up doubling that power loss straight away. So the limitation really is one of um, you just you 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 end up compromising your um, your efficiency of your converter because of the additional losses caused by reverse recovery. So it's it's more of an efficiency argument. Um, let's have a look here. Um, hi there. I'm wondering what is the simulation tool used for the double pulse test? Is it Cadence, and do they have libraries for a big range of device manufacturers? Um, Yes, it was Cadence. It was their PSPICE software. You, 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 um, to simulate the things like reverse recovery on a, on a, on a, to actually look at the trajectory of what's happening in the device, you need a circuit simulator, simulator like PSPICE. Um, things like, I mean, we also run a, a simulation tool called Plex, uh, which is a fantastically powerful tool. But the way they work slightly differently. Um, Plex has been optimized to do um, much longer simulations quickly. And it, it approximates that the energy or the switching transition is an instantaneous event with a fixed amount of energy associate or energy loss associated with it. So that E on and E off data that you can take from an IGBT data sheet, you can, you can put that into Plex and it will give you an idea of the, of the efficiency hit. However, what Plex doesn't do is model that switching trajectory. So if you're really interested in the fine detail of that, you need to use a tool um, like PSPICE or LT Spice would probably do it as well. Um, they, there are a huge amount of libraries around the place um, for uh, that you can get from device manufacturers. Um, you have to be very careful though, because the like, like any, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm on an interesting panel discussion this afternoon talking about simulation of power electronic converters you have to be careful with simulation because the results you get especially switching trajectories will depend primarily on how the device has been modeled and you don't necessarily know how the device has been modeled by the manufacturer the, the Vichy ones we found to be pretty good um, and correlate fairly well with real world um, and they use something called a, a diode macro model which is uh, like an inbuilt model modeling block um, you can also use behavioral models to, 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 to model some of these effects but no model is perfect so you just have to be careful about believing the results too much the ones I showed you today are fairly accurate, um, but, but nothing really beats real bench measurement. Um, what's the cost delta between silicon and silicon carbide? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's, 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 it's still quite significant. I, I don't actually have any, any data for you on that. Um, the, way, the best way to answer those, that, that question is really, if you compare just the cost of silicon versus a silicon carbide diode, it would be pretty hard to justify ever going to silicon carbide. What you really have to do is look at the benefits that the silicon carbide or other wide band gap technology, what benefits does it bring at system level? So does it allow you to make it smaller or does it make you allow, allow you to, to, to run, up, um, run it more efficiently? Um, or does it reduce your amount of EMI filtering because you haven't got QRR to worry about? So really the, the, the value in wide band gap technology like silicon carbide tends to be felt at system level, which always makes it hard for people selling that technology because people tend to benchmark just the two diodes and it just doesn't stack up. You've got to look at system level and the benefits you can achieve at system level. Um, and 
common is silicon carbide is fairly commonly used in high performance power converters now uh, because of those system level benefits um another question here can i use sick fets for high switching frequencies at about 250 kilohertz in the less than 100 volt uh, range um you could do uh, you might, might, you wouldn't really it's not a, it's not a good fit necessarily for silicon carbide down at less than 100 volts it's it, you wouldn't have the benefits of that silicon technology down at those voltage levels can perform very very well because um, the, the, the behavior of the parasitic body diode is different um, and also down at that voltage level you, you could also consider using technologies like gallium nitride which have very very high uh, performance capabilities up to probably well i think most most GAN technology tops out at about 600 volts now, um, but there's some nice technology from people like EPC that are targeting those voltage levels that would work very well at those frequencies. I, I would tend to keep silicon carbide um, as being useful for probably 900 volt, 1200 volt, those sorts of voltage ranges. Otherwise, it, it, its benefits aren't really worth what you're paying for it. Um, let's take a look at one more question here. I apologize, we won't have time to do all of those um, today. Um, let's have a look. Uh, when a MOSFET is conducting and the current is flowing through the body diode, does it also flow through the RDS on if this results in a lower voltage drop? Oh, well, that's a neat question. And I, it's something I should have actually mentioned. I should have mentioned this on the on the on the webinar. The um, the benefit of a MOSFET being unipolar, um, even though it's got this body diode, because it's unipolar, the channel, the RDS on, can actually support current in both directions. Um, so if you were to turn the MOSFET on, um, you can actually support current flow in both both directions. And if it goes backwards, so you what you might think normally is going back through the diode. If the current level you're supporting multiplied by the RDS on of the device is less than the forward voltage drop of the diode, actually it's the channel that's gonna be supporting. So the, the device will actually throw, flow back through the RDS on, the current flows back that way. Um, and that's very commonly used in something called a synchronous rectifier. Um, that half bridge arrangement um, is, is, is a building block of say a, a synchronous buck converter. So rather than having a constant diode drop, you can actually use the RDS on of the device and it will report you, uh, it, it will um, uh, conduct the current and enhance the efficiency. So uh, yes, I should have mentioned that that's a very common use of a unipolar device like a MOSFET. Um, and it can give you very high performance in doing that. You, you can't do that with um, RGBTs uh, because they're bipolar devices. Um, so I think we're probably just about done today. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for, for attending today. I hope the content was at the right level. I'd, I'd very much welcome any feedback you can provide on the technical level, um, the delivery, anything like that. Uh, please do let us know how, how you found it and then we can improve over time without the rest of this series. So thank you very much for attending and I hope to join you uh, on the next webinar. Bye-bye.